as I was reading that story, I was, what came to my mind was that I stood right here exactly a year ago today, and I read from a Facebook post that was written by a woman who was in the, um, the concert venue that was attacked by ISIS a year ago. This is the, the day of commemoration of attacks. 130 people in Paris were killed a year ago today. And there were memorials around the city today. And I remember reading off of my phone this little Facebook post of this woman sharing her story of lying still among dead bodies, pretending to be dead, trying to be dead, and hoping that she would not get shot. And what she shared of this was to assure people that their loved ones who were lying on the floor dying were thinking only of the ones they loved. She said, I can assure you of that because that's all I could think of as I realized that I might not live through this. I thought only of the people I loved and I sent love to them. When we're not involved in these events, it's easy to condemn them and to condemn the people and to, to feel the rage and feel, yes, in our Christian hearts, some hatred toward people who would inflict these things upon others, upon their fellow humans. We live in dark times, it seems. And Jesus' followers were reminded of they were, they were strolling past the temple. Now, we think of Herod as the, um, the paranoid king who had all the babies in Bethlehem killed as he sought the king that he thought was going to replace him. History remembers him as a great architect and builder. And the temple that the the apostles were walking through, that Jesus and his followers were walking through, they were admiring, was a temple that had been built by Herod. And it was a glorious temple. It was gorgeous. There are, I think, some um, renditions of it in play, probably in Europe, probably even back in the heavy, um, images of what this temple might have looked like. Interestingly enough, when Luke wrote this gospel, you have to remember that Luke was not one of the apostles. He was a physician. He was Greek. But he was a follower of Jesus. And he went along with Paul as a documentarian of sorts, as someone who felt called to write these stories down for history, for posterity. And so the Gospel of Luke was not written until about, about 60, 70 AD, actually later than that. And what we have to understand in Luke's telling of the story is that Luke witnessed the destruction of the temple. Within 10 years of, of, um, of his writing, the temple had been destroyed. So Luke is writing prophecy, but he's writing prophecy from living in that age that Jesus was prophesying. And he saw people who were betrayed by family members. <coughs> and he saw Christians who were taken into synagogues and tried, and Christians who were imprisoned for their faith. He saw this. And what he understood was that Jesus and his words had been telling us these truths. So we are not the only ones who are, who are witnesses at a distance for the horrific things that people do to each other. Luke saw this, and he saw that the temple destruction was only part, part of a large, large government movement against minorities which was the Jews in Rome, in the Roman Empire. Okay? We have this image, and we put it up against the reading that I asked 
Greg to read this morning instead of the, the brief little one from Malachi. Because it was a hopeful, glorious reading from the third section of the prophecies of Isaiah. This is the return of the Jews to Jerusalem from exile. And these beautiful words talk about building something new. I'm going to create a new world, a new Jerusalem, a place where predator and prey will sit together, where carnivorous mammals will be eating grain, where every creature, no matter how large or small, can feel safe and secure. So we have this morning this sense of, of tension between the joy and the possibility of a new created order and all of the wrecky stuff that has to happen <coughs> for that to take place. The violence, the disorder, the destruction of property, the destruction of ancient, ancient buildings. I don't know if you had seen this. It came up several weeks ago online. Um, they were pictures of Aleppo just 10, 15 years ago. And what a glorious city it was. It was bright and it was white and it was full of beautiful buildings and temples and mosques and buildings that were ancient, ancient historical buildings. And then they would fade to the pictures of what the city looks like today. There, it's not there. It's not there anymore. This is the kind of thing that Jesus was seeing. He was seeing, yes, look at these glorious temples. Look at this beautiful city. I tell you, it will not be here. That is a really hard hard thing to think about, to take in when we talk about creating something new. We have attachments to beauty. We have attachments to things that are ancient and glorious that speak to us of history, that speak to us of better times, beautiful times, times when, when workers toiled for decades to build cathedrals and temples and mosques. Do you see how fast buildings go up now in Vancouver? They're up. They're just up. The workmanship that people prize in generations have passed is, is not there. It's not present in what we see going up today. There's not a sense of the permanence and the lasting quality, the beauty of what has been before us. And yet it is so easy to take that beauty and demolish it. We're living in very difficult times. Some of us feel like super difficult times right now. Some of us feel like we're on a path towards something new. And none of us knows for sure how the next four years will unfold. But we live by a promise that is greater than any promise any politician can make. We live by a promise that is within our hearts and within our souls. And that promise is what moves us into the created order and the creative order. Martin Luther was once asked what he would do if someone, if he knew or someone had told him that the world was coming to an end. And he said, if the judgment was tomorrow, then today I would want to plant an apple tree. A sign of hope that judgment 
is not destruction. Judgment is the beginning of new creation. And I would suggest, or I would put forth, that, that, that creating a new heaven and a new earth is not a momentary thing in time. And it is something that we participate in every day. When we refuse to be discouraged by what we see going on in the world, when we refuse to feel devoured by the events around us, when we refuse to act out of fear and out of hatred and choose to act from love and from hope. Last night I read an article by, it was interesting, it was a gay Muslim Pakistani American who, observing the dynamics around the whole political discourse of the last year, decided to go to one of the final frontiers, Alaska, and talk to people in Alaska about how does this year feel to you? How do the politics of this year feel to you? And it wasn't so much the information that he gleaned that was important in, our, in reading the article, but that he actually chose to sit in people's kitchens and hear the concerns of their hearts. Politics can turn us into enemies. Jesus has turned us into friends, all of us, regardless of what side we stand on in the political spectrum. We are called to engage in love and we are called to continue working for that which we believe in. It's easy to look at a new creation or a new heaven and earth in what we call apocalyptic terms. Apocalypse is a genre of literature that we tend to very simplistically think of as the literature about the end of the earth, the literature about the end times. And when we add that word time to the, to the conversation, we inject something that takes it out of our sphere of influence. Because in fact, there is no end time because every time is an end of something and a beginning of something new. And in actuality, the word apocalypse does not necessarily mean end times or final destruction. It simply means revelation. Revelation, the pulling back the curtain of what we see every day that has now become old hat to reveal something new. And that revelation does not have to be pushed back to some future time and some future event. That revelation comes today. When we choose in this day to accept judgment on our tendencies to be, to be hateful, or conflictual, or to be judgmental ourselves, and to pull back that curtain and reveal what we were really truly created to be, which was the light of the world. When Paul talks to the Thessalonians, it, his, it's a letter of, these are paragraphs of admonition, and what is happening is in the church in Thessalonica, there, this, is, um, this is during that time after Jesus' death, and there's a, a strong sense of his imminent return. He's going to be here any day. He's going to be here any day. And there are people who feel like, well, if he's coming,
coming, then why do we need to plant and harvest and cook and build and do this stuff? Why don't we just kick back and relax and wait for him to show up? And Paul says, no. This does not excuse you from the work that needs to be done. Basically, he says, if you don't work in your Christian community, you don't eat in your Christian community. Because time is irrelevant here. It's not about what's going to happen five years from now, ten years from now, four years from now when you go through this all again. It's what happens today. What happens today when you go out in the fields next to your neighbor or your spouse or your family member. It's what happens when you go to temple today with your family, your friends, or when you go to whatever place you would gather in Thessalonica as Christians, early Christians. It's about today and how you are going to create a new heaven and a new earth here and now. Here and now. I have a tree, actually a few trees in the backyard. It's a dead cherry tree. It is dead. And every once in a while we have one of those big windstorms, some major branches fall off this tree, go flying across the yard or hit the ground. But I was looking at this tree closely late in the summer, and there's a tree growing up there. It's a fir tree. Go figure. It's a fir tree growing out of the dead remains of a cherry tree. Okay? These are the cycles. These are the cycles. something new to grow. I just read today that an aspen grove is all one tree. It's one common root system and all of these trees grow out of it and it's actually as far as the roots go, the, un the underground, the unseen, it's all one. Parts of us that are unseen, we are all one. From one source to one destiny. And when the political landscape feels dry and barren, or feels threatening, or feels hopeless, that is when we remember that deep down we are rooted in a hope that transcends any event in the historical or political or socioeconomic life of people on this planet. And when we stand firm, grounded in our unity, and we stand firm, bringing in the light, then we are in the business of creating a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus told us this. He said, you will do great things. You'll do the same things I did, and you will do even greater things. This is my promise to you. And that promise is there because Jesus knew that times can get really, really tough. And that God's presence in these tough times is embodied in us. In our ability to, to express hope, in our ability live out a promise of a new order. Not somewhere in the future. And not in the past. But right now. Right now. We are the future. And we bring it into the world 
where we live, how we live. In Jesus' name.